actually the whole background on that and why I would go into neurology starts out in Farmington, New Mexico, which is a little tiny town up by the Four Corners area. And um, I was about the only kid in the class that was interested in science because it was way off in the boondocks. Um, and I was going, why me? Uh, and why me and not the next person next to me or the person down, you know, uh, down the street? And so there was sort of that question that came up. And as that kind of uh, moved through high school and college and, and, and medical school, uh, it came to be uh, that pretty much neurology was the thing I wanted to be involved in. We know from studies that have already been done looking at um, thicknesses of the cortex of the brain, the, the, the rind that's on the outside, that in people who are long-term meditators, uh, that some very interesting areas of the cortex in the parietal lobes and down in the hippocampus, um, which is um, the hippocampus is the memory storage, that these areas get thicker and they get thicker by as much as a millimeter, which in the brain is tremendous distance. Um, and so it seems that there's that there's data that now begins to suggest that a meditative practice begun early and continued on has protective effects against some of the things that we see happening in aging brains, which is loss of neurons, loss of the synaptic connections between one neuron and the next neuron. Um, that sort of pruning that starts to happen and you look at a brain that's a 60-year-old brain and it quite clearly looks much more like a shriveled, dried-up walnut than a very, very th you know, full, thick uh, uh, brain that you have as a 20-year-old. As a um, and I think that there are a number of different research lines from functional MRI studies to um, neuropsychological studies, things like that, that have really begun to, you know, to kind of show this data as a protective effect against, uh, against aging and dementia. I started meditation uh, with a, a teacher by the name of Shinzen Young in Los Angeles back in the 80s um, and did little, a little bit of meditation uh, you know, during the 80s and early 90s. And then when I moved to Marin County uh, in Northern California in 94, uh, I became more affiliated with the Spirit Rock community, which is a, um, a Buddhist meditation center, uh, which is in what we call the Theravadan lineage, which is the Southeast Asian uh, lineage of, of Buddhism, which pretty much focuses for the most part on just mindfulness meditation, just being in the present moment, concentrating on attention, following the breath, paying attention to the breath, as in a... Uh, uh, the, the term Theravadan uh, means the, the, the teaching of the alders, and it's basically, a, so the, the, the thought is, is that this is a passed down person to person to person through the generations from the initial group of monastics that were followers of Gautama Siddhartha the Buddha. You know, a basic meditation practice is first to um, Basically, to set up the first to set up the intention to meditate, you know, I'm going to take some time away from my life right now and sit and be quiet and and look inward. That setting up the intention is the initial frame of the, uh, of the meditative practice. And to do that, you, first off, you have to have kind of a picture of where it is you're going to go. Um, so. The, your past experience with meditation or with meditation instructions or even with the question, gee, I'd like to learn how to meditate, um, you know, as a, a first-time person sitting on the cushion, that establishes sort of this picture. And that actually probably for, you know, anatomically sits back here in the parietal occipital areas of the brain, which are our visual processing and association cortex that sort of set up the vision. And then there's an interesting dance between there and the frontal lobes. And the frontal lobes are the part of the brain that set the, neck, that set the plan for action. Um, particularly dorsolateral frontal lobes tend to be the areas that say, uh, I'm going to initiate a whole sequence of motor acts. And you do this every time you decide to go to the grocery store. 
I get up out of my chair, I walk to the car, I put the key in the ignition, turn the ignition on, drive, try not to run over little old ladies and dogs, mm -hmm. and get to the grocery store parking lot, get out of the car, walk into the grocery store. There's a whole sequence of actions that all of us can kind of you know, run very quickly. That there's, and there's kind of the whole meta programming for that, which is enca encased in the little phrase, I'm going to the grocery store to get, to get this week's groceries. And there's a whole sequence that gets th uh, th uh, filled out as you move through that, that plan. That initiating sense is up in front. So there's the intention. The second thing is to essentially come into the body to kind of pull away from um, always dealing with outside, you know, environmental stimuli and actually just to kind of come in and center. And, the, and, and then the, and the idea behind that is to move into um, more the internal message of the body and try to pay attention to what's going on uh, energetically within the, within the body and not necessarily where the body contacts the external world. So that is, that is sort of taking up the posture. Typically the, in the meditations that, um, that, that Rick and I have done out at Spirit Rock, we will use the breath as a focus. Um, and the breath as a focus is a very interesting thing, a little sidelight here. Breath is one of the few automatic, autonomic functions of your body over which you have volitional control, and yet will completely take, will completely run on its own. Um, it has volitional control in what I'm doing now. I take in a breath, and then I expend that breath, passing it over the vocal cords in order to be able to talk to you. Um, you know, but it's also completely involuntary, and as long as I am alive, it'll continue to run because I can sit here and hold my breath until I turn blue. But then, and some two-year-olds will do this, uh, and then. But the only thing that will happen then is I'll fall down, and then I'll begin to breathe spontaneously. We create also as we do this uh, a sense of safety because what we're trying to do there is to relax the threat detection system in the brain, which is located mostly in um, lower limbic systems, uh, brainstem uh, activation areas, uh, where the brain is kind of constantly on the look for threats from the outside. We want to essentially kind of downplay those. And we also want to relax into this meditation so that we can be quiet, so that we can be comfortable. And that's activating uh, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is sort of the rest and digest, it's the, uh, the relaxation, basic maintenance function side of the autonomic nervous system, um, uh, sympathetic, parasympathetic, that basically regulates your basic body state as you are right now. And we spend a lot of time in our sympathetic side, particularly in this culture, because we're always on threat condition, orange or red, you know, courtesy of the National Security Service. Um, but, um, you know, Homeland Security. Well, we, we tend to run there, and we tend to be driven there by the culture, because if you're in orange or red, you tend to be more responsive to whatever it is the culture wants you to do. So we get manipulated that way a lot. But that's actually not good for you long term. It has lots of different consequences. And so we want to activate the parasympathetic side and get people to relax, stop the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, uh, stress response stimulating cortisol, which is a neurotoxin, um, and basically get the patient to center. Um, that can get to be kind of interesting because, you, you know, somebody sitting there who has a bum knee and whose knee is aching and you're asking them to sit there and enjoy that experience. And so a lot of times in terms of instructions um, or, or discussions with people who are meditating, a uh, number of teachers will talk about if the pain arises. You know, you breathe into that area of pain or you examine that as an area of pain, as an area of focus, to watch the pain fragment from ow to, oh, this feels a little hot, it feels like needles, it has a burning quality, it comes and goes in intensity, it expands or contracts about the area of the body, you break it up into little tiny pieces. Well, my view of this, which, you know, not necessarily supported by any scientific data, yeah. uh, 
but my view of my view of what rituals um, are useful for is they are ways of defining for the brain what is about to happen and what kind of experiences uh, will occur as a result of these behaviors. Um, I think one of the great strengths of the, of the human central nervous system is its ability to run simulations. Um, that probably is our major evolutionary tool. Ritual encapsulates for us a, a, a habitual practice that leads to a state that we seek. Um, for example, in, in meditation practice, there's the ritual of sitting on the zafu, you know, bringing yourself into the right posture, um, bringing your attention to the breath, holding your attention on the breath, and sustaining that practice for several minutes in order to try to achieve a sense of, of focused concentration because with that sense of focused concentration comes a large number of other benefits, a sensation of peacefulness, a sensation of, of energy, an ability to deal better with the environment in the next few minutes after you get up off the cushion, um, a you know, sense of union and other spiritual experiences that one can have. Now, the ultimate goal in meditation is not to be encapsulated in rites and rituals. In fact, there's a very explicit uh, prohibition from the Buddha that says, don't be caught by rites and rituals. That's not the path. Rites and rituals will not get you there. They will not get you free from suffering. And in terms of spiritual experience, they are not the things that generate spiritual ex uh, the spiritual experiences. Those happen on their own. Um, you know the, the the classic old joke is that you know is that enlightenment happens by uh, happens by the accident of grace and meditation makes you accident prone. Uh, you know that's you know, which is sort of the idea. So that's how the rites and rituals are. They sort of they set up behaviors for then the brain to have the expectation of something. This uh, for those of you who don't know you know short course in neuroanatomy frontal lobes were, that I was talking about where you have the the, the initiation of intention are up here. Parietal lobes are this big wide area in the back here. Occipital lobes are this area in the back. This does actually visual processing. And as it moves forward, you get more information relating to the spatial relationships of visual processing. As it moves into the temporal lobes, which is this structure here, you get more of the naming or the emotional content of visual processing. Um, about 40% or so of the human brain is devoted to visual processing. So you can imagine, this is one of the reasons we're such a visual animal. In a meditator, one of the things that happens is that we move away from this kind of processing. Because you can think, when most of the time when you're meditating, we actually ask you to kind of close your eyes or to... Um, maybe have them half open. So we make this area much less, this area of the brain, this occipital area of visual processing, much less important. We're trying to bring you in, side, inside the brain. This is brain stem. This is the hypothalamus and basal ganglia and structures that incorporate the limbic system, which is pretty much this whole area of brain that's involved in, you know, in memory and sort of uh, emotional relationship to memory and the um, essentially the relationship of the, myself as an organism. This is sort of a selfing structure. Inside, remember this is how that hemisphere looked. Inside that hemisphere is some area we call the insular cortex, which there's a superior part of the insular cortex and an inferior portion. And, this is a, and that cortex is responsible for the internal sensations uh, of the body. And then this is the temporal, temporal lobe of the left hemisphere. And in here is a structure called the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory, verbal memory on the left side, visual memory on the right. And just in front of that is a little structure called the amygdala, which is a structure that's responsible for adding emotional 
uh, tone to whatever it is that you're remembering. 